Hello everybody and welcome to a brand new Elder Scrolls online character build video with me, Sherman. Today guys, I bring you guys something special. A surprise build, the Bladesinger. A lot of people have been asking me to bring this out and so I finally decided I would uh, bring it out ahead of time so you guys could have it. But before we get started, disclaimer, this is a roleplay casual build. This is not meant for meta play, so it's meant for the casual role players. Now, to get started, to give you guys a little background into where this idea came from, I'm a huge D&D player, so I play a lot of Dungeons & Dragons, and one of the things that they had in Dungeons & Dragons was called a Bladesinger, somebody who, who, who utilized both sword and sorcery together to give them a unique play style. And I really liked the concept and idea of it back in the day when I first... Uh, when they first introduced it in 2nd edition. They brought it back in 5th edition, and I really like it in 5th edition. I, I'm not going to lie. It's really fun to play. It's a really interesting um, play style. And I do have somebody in my, my group that plays one, uh, even though he hasn't been there lately. But, <clears throat> yeah. So this is for you guys, the Bladesinger. Let's take a look at it. As you can see, we are a Wood Elf Sorcerer. A lot of people thought this was going to be the Wood Elf Hero, uh, but it's not. <laughs> or the High Elf Hero. It's not. It is the Bladesinger character. And as you can see, Wood Elf Sorcerer, we do have 64 points into stamina. This is to allow our character to be built more into a hybridized stamina character. And we can still take advantage of Magicka as well. Um, I'll show you guys what I mean by that when we get further into the character itself. If you want to play a tank, you can switch over your attribute points into health, or you can switch them into Magicka. Your choice, depending on what role you want to play. This is for stamina DPS, tank, and healer, is how I have this set up. You can play Magicka DPS with this, but it's not going to be as quite as effective as a stamina damage dealer. So, as you can see, we have 21k Magicka, 19k health, 31k max stamina, we do have 1,015 mag recovery with 1,199 stamina recovery, which is really good. We do have a 2378 weapon damage with a 48% weapon critical, 19 or 1,986 spell damage with a 41% spell critical. A lot of this gets boosted, trust me. 14k spell resist with 13k physical resist. We are using the Thief Mundus Stone. We do have major prophecy at all times because of the way this build plays, and we are using tri-stat food. Now remember, this build's primary role is a damage dealer. They are not... <clears throat> they can tank and they can heal if you want them to, but their primary design is to be a damage dealer. So let's go ahead and move on to the next part, which is our equipment. So... As we go over here, you guys can see that one of our sets is going to be Netch's Touch. That's a given for this. It works so well. So, we are using Netch's Touch as one of the sets. I will go over the, them in a minute. Um, but let's go over drinks and food. So, the, po the, food, the potions we use are tripods for when we're tanking. Spellcaster pots or power spell power pots for when we're playing a damage dealer. Uh, or a healer, I mean. And then a weapon power pots or stamina power pots for when we're playing a damage dealer, a uh, stamina damage dealer. Now we do use tri-stat food pretty much all the time on this because it works best for this character build. As you can see, we get uh, all three stats, magicka, health, and stamina from this. Really good. But let's go over the sets now. Starting with our monster set, we are using Stormfist. Stormfist as long as you're within melee range, Stormfist can be really good. It works good at range too, but it's not as effective because enemies will move out of it. When they're right up on you, they don't move out of it. They stay right in the area, so it's really good for that kind of play. So that's why we use the Stormfist. And as you can see, this thing gives you, on the one piece, stamina recovery, two piece. When you deal damage, with a, uh, deal damage you have a 10% chance to create a Thunder Fist to crush the enemy, dealing X amount of shock damage every second for 3 seconds, and then all enemies within 4 meters on the final strike take X amount of physical damage when the fist closes. This effect can occur once every 8 seconds. So this is really good. It's really powerful. And the 4 meter radius is both shock and physical damage. <clears throat> the next set we are using is Briarheart. Now, Briarheart is, is one that drops in Orsinium, 
This drops in Tempest Island, by the way. This drops in Orsinium. And so you do have to have the or Orsinium DLC to, to farm it. But you can buy it from other players if you don't have the Orsinium DLC. So as you can see, this adds weapon critical on the two piece, three piece adds max stamina, four piece adds weapon critical, and then when you deal damage, uh, deal critical damage, you have a 10% chance to increase your weapon damage by 449 for 10 seconds. While this effect is active, your critical strikes heal you for X amount of health, and the effect can occur once every 15 seconds. Now, it lasts for 10, you get a five second downtime before it re reapplies, and that's any critical damage, both magicka and stamina. So this will pretty much be up non-stop. The next set we're using, of course, is Netch's Touch. Netch's Touch is really great for this because on the two piece, it gives you spell crit, three piece gives you max magicka, and then the four piece gives you spell damage. It's the five piece that really, really stands out though, and this adds 400 spell damage to your shock damage abilities. So being a Sork, you have several shock damage abilities that you can use within the class. So you can actually take advantage of this set, even with the low magicka pool, because it's going to give you a really high spell damage output. Alright, so moving on now to the traits and enchants on the gear. With the monster set, <clears throat> Helm, you can see we have a reinforce with a tri stat. This is going to give you that hybrid, the, the ability to be hybridized, but it's also going to give you that higher resistance value so you can play tankier or you can play more, you know, survivable. Onto the body, we are using invigorating. This is going to give you higher stam, um, health magic of stam recovery by 11. And we also have this on the leggings. And as you can see with these, we also have tri stats in all the big pieces. Now, I get asked all the time, why do you do this? To hybridize the character so it can play any role necessary. So that's why we have that that way. On the smaller pieces, they are all divines. And as you can see, the belt and the shoulders have max magicka enchants. This is so we can play better in the magicka when we need to. And then we have stamina in the in the gloves and boots to allow us to play more stamina based when we when we want to be more damage based. So that's why we have this setup. <sighs> All right, moving on now to the rings. We have two rings here, both tri room. Um, tri room allows you to be more hybridized again. And then we have a weapon damage here, and we have a spell damage here. Now, on the necklace, we do have an infused magic recovery. Because we don't get magic recovery as the race for Wood Elf, we want to be able to get it from somewhere, so we're going to use this. The monster set is going to give us some, some extra health or stamina recovery, and then being a Wood Elf itself gives us extra stamina recovery in our passive. So we actually can, can hybridize really well with that. The other race that's really good at this is Khajiit. So... Moving on to the weapons, starting with the main hand, we do have a sword with Netch's Touch, uh, infused shock damage. We have a Netch's Touch dagger, Nernhoned, with absorbed stamina. Somebody asked me, why do you use sword and dagger combo? Why don't you use dagger dagger a lot? The reason I use the sword and dagger combo is, see, dagger gives you extra crit. And you don't need a lot, just enough to carry you to a certain point. The sword gives you extra physical damage. So I'm going to show you guys this real quick so you guys can see under dual wield. Um, the twin blade and blunt. Each sword increases the damage done by 3%. Or sorry, it increases all your damage done by 3%. doesn't matter whether it's magicka or stamina. It will boost all damage done. So that's what, the other reason why I use sword there. Is because it boosts all my damage. The dagger gives me higher crit, which is nice... Um, because it applies to my character's overall crit capability. But I am wearing five pieces of medium armor with this. So this build uses a heavy helm, light shoulders, and everything else is medium. So we can take advantage of the 5-1-1 setup. This is for our passive and undaunted skill line. Um, we can also take advantage of the trait, or the passives in the light armor and the heavy armor, to apply to our character. So that's why we have this set up here. Now, the reason I use the sword and dagger, that was just explained. And then on the back bar, we do have an infused bow with a weapon and spell damage enchant. 
So when this thing procs, it doesn't boost just your weapon damage, it boosts your weapon damage and your spell damage for both bars. So as long as this stays up and effective, you're getting higher damage output overall. Alright, now that you guys have seen that, we're going to go jump over and talk about skills and passives. So for the class, I always take every skill and learn every skill I can. The reason why is you never know when you might need it. In certain situations, you might want to take advantage of certain skills, so that way you have them there for that purpose of, hey, you know what, we're in a situation where the group's just not being as effective as we could be uh, with CC and crowd control. I can use Restraining Prison to hold enemies in place. Or I can use something like uh, Defensive Ruin, which a lot of people don't understand. This is really good because when uh, you place a Rune of Protection on yourself for two minutes, while active, the next enemy to attack you is imprisoned in a constricting sphere of dark magic, stunning them after a short delay of for three seconds. So, and this stun cannot be blocked. So when I'm playing in PvE, I use this when I tank sometimes. When I'm playing in PvP, I use this when I'm playing just as a damage dealer. I use this to reflect an enemy to stop them from killing me. Um, so you have a lot of d different tools within your class that do a lot of different things. This is why I learned every active and passive ability for my classes because you never know when you're going to be able to use it or not. In this case I'm going to take advantage of mostly my storm calling side and my daedric summoning side because this does shock damage, this does shock damage. Now I could have went with the other um, the imp or whatever it's called and the uh, f familiar and this thing does shock damage as well, but I like using this for when I'm tanking. So, a lot of this stuff just depends on different situations. Now, when it comes to weapons and gear, I'm going to go back over here real quick because I want you to see this. I do have other weapons unlocked because I can play this character dual wield on both bars, or I can play them with a bow and a sword and shield. So I can tank. And that's why I have this character with so many different weapons, too. Now, when you go back in here and you look at the skills, I have Sword and Shield unlocked. I have Dual Wield, Active, and Passives unlocked. because And the Bow, because those are the skills that I primarily use. Now, I could learn Restoration Staff if I wanted to, to be a healer. And then I could run a Dual Wield Resto Staff combo, or even a Two-Handed Resto Staff combo, and still play the character fine because I can take advantage of that higher spell capability that my character has built into him. So that's why I set these characters up this way, so that they can play very universally. So going over the sword and shield, you can see I unlock the passives and active abilities that fit my playstyle. Same thing with dual wield um, for this particular character, and same thing with bow. Since that's what this character uses mostly, that's what I have unlocked. Now moving on to armor skills, light armor, I do always take the top three light armor passives because even though I'm a medium armor build, I can still take advantage of spell warding, which is the reduced uh, or higher spell resistance by 363. People don't understand it. Every amount of resistance you can get out of your character is going to make you more defensive. For every 660 points of resistance that you have, you get one point of mitigation. That means you get one, um, basically one value of, of damage reduction. Not damage reduction, but damage mitigation. There's a difference between damage mitigation and damage reduction. Damage mitigation comes off first, reduction comes off after. The way the game calculates the damage in this is when you block an attack, it, it reduces the damage based on the block. Then it hits your resistances, and then it hits your damage reduction. So it basically calculates super fast, I mean, in lightning speed, okay, this person blocked the attack, they reduced the amount of damage by 10% because they don't have a sword and shield. They, they did this, which reduces their damage by X amount by their damage mitigation. And then they have their damage reduction, which reduces the damage even more. This is why I build for high resistance, good damage reduction, and the ability to block. So I can take advantage of all those different things within my character. So, <clears throat> evocation increases mag recovery by 4% and reduces my cost as magic abilities by 2%. That can be used. Also, grace 
allows me to have a reduced effect of snares and stuff and sprint costs. Medium armor, I am a medium armor build, so I do have all the passives. As you can see, dexterity increases my crit chance for each piece of medium armor. The Windwalker increases my stamina recovery for each piece of medium armor by 4%. I have 20%, and then reduced stamina cost of stamina abilities by 2% per piece of medium armor. That's a 10%. I have improved sneak and reduced uh, sneak detection. I also have agility, which increases my weapon damage by 15%. And then I also have Athletics, which increases my movement speed of Sprint by 3% for each piece of medium armor, and reduces my dodge roll cost by 4% for each piece of medium armor. On heavy armor, I do have the three uh, top ones picked. Resolve uh, increases physical and spell resist by 362 for each piece of heavy armor equipped. See, everything that you equip gives you different benefits. So you're gonna, you wanna take as much, as much advantage of every option you can. See, this 362, plus that 300 and something you get from the light armor actually gives you one point of mitigation for spell. And then the 362, depending on how you have your CP set up, could give you another point of mitigation in physical. So it's like really good. Constitution increases health recovery by 4%. Not really necessary, but it's the next one. You restore 108 magic and stamina when you take damage for each piece of heavy armor equipped. We do get 108 stamina and magic back whenever we take damage. That applies to you really well in a lot of ways. It's small, but it can still help. <clears throat> then we have Juggernaut, which increases your max health by 2% for each piece of heavy armor, which stacks, this 2% stacks with the Undaunted and the CP. So CP, you get 20% increase in max health. Undaunted, you get 6%. So you get a 28% increase of max health. You get a 26% of stamina and magicka. Moving on to the world skills. Now, you can be a vampire or werewolf with this. It doesn't matter. I just don't do that with a lot of my characters because I'm a role player. I role play characters. So I, if my character doesn't fit that persona of having werewolf or... or or a vampire, I don't do it. So you can do that if you choose. I do use this ability a lot. It surprised me how much I can use this ability, and I use it in PvE and PvP. So I also use Consuming Traps sometimes if I've got a lot of empty soul gems I want to fill, but also because of the fact that it restores 10% of your max health, magic, and stamina when an enemy dies. So I use this a lot when I'm out in the open world playing around, doing stuff, and I need to fill soul gems. Shatter Soul. Really good for when you have one of these abilities slotted. Anytime you drop below 20% health, you do X amount of managed damage to all enemies within 8 meters of you. And it can happen every 2, two minutes. We also have Soul Summons. Uh, allows you to revive every hour without a spinning a Soul Gem. And then Soul Lock. Killing an enemy with a weapon ability has a 10% chance to automatically filling an empty Soul Gem. People have been asking me, why do you unlock all this stuff? So I'm kind of going over it. Fighter's Guild, I do unlock all the active abilities and ultimate because of what the way the, the, the tools that they can be used for in different situations like Silver Leash can be used by tanking, I can use Rearming Trap when I'm playing damage, I can use uh, Ring of Preservation when I'm playing group support, I can use Flawless Dawn Rate Breaker when I'm playing a, a damage dealer or even a tank. Mage's Guild, I do the same thing, I use Shooting Star even though it does flame damage. Because I want to boost this character's damage as much, much as I can, so this is an ability I might use. I use Inner Light. Right now I even have it on my bar, so I can boost my Max Magicka by 5% and give me a major prophecy. I can also detect hidden enemies when I'm playing in PvP and sometimes in PvE. Structured Entropy I use for when I'm tanking, if I need more health, and I need to heal over time. And also grants me Major Sorcery. On top of that, I use Scalding Ruins sometimes for um, magic DPS just to have on the bar um, as an extra ability. I use Balance for if I need uh, higher resistances and stuff and I wanna, I'm want i willing to sacrifice my health for, for Magicka, I might use Balance. Also, the passives are really good. Once they're all unlocked, they apply to all this stuff and it works out really well. Sigic Order, I do unlock different skills and passives for different things for different situations. Again, just like with anything, everything I unlock, I do it for a reason. Because it might help me in different situations. Either dungeon play, solo play, uh, PvP, um, trial play, playing in, in small group play, like running around in the world. 
or even two manning in dungeons, that kind of thing. Undaunted, same thing, I learn all the active abilities and I take the passives. The passives are really, really good because one thing about all the active abilities, they're all synergies. So all of these can be activated as a synergy, which can do this. Undaunted Command. Activating an ally synergy restores 4% of your max health, stamina, and magicka. As you can see, it gives me back 877 health, 1,266 stamina, and 852 magicka. Now, if somebody was to throw me an orb, I would get 3,960 magicka or stamina, whichever is higher. In my case, stamina. Plus, I'd get another 1,000. So I'd actually get almost 5,000 stamina back. Then, my Undaunted Metal increases my max health, stamina, and magic by 2% per type of armor equipped. Heavy, medium, light that have you have equipped will give you 6% increase in your max stats. Alliance War, we take I take the active skills that work best for me. I don't take the passives unless I focus in a PvP. I don't play a lot of PvP, so I don't focus into those. And the same thing goes with the Alliance War support skills. I take the ones that best reflect me for PvE, and I use Magicka Aid for when I have these equipped, because it increases my mag recovery. Now, racial skills. Because I'm a Wood Elf, I do get Hunter's Eye, which increases my stealth detection radius by 3 meters, so I can see people better in stealth, um, without the need for using the uh, Inner Light. But I still use Inner Light quite a bit for that. Um, I have Ifri's Endurance, which increases stem recovery by 258, and then on top of that, assist, uh, Resist Affliction, which reduce, increases ma max stamina by 2000 and Poison Resist by 2310, and I gain immunity to Poison status effects. Now, any race can play this build, okay? You can be any race. You can be a Nord, you can be an Orc, you can be an Imperial, you can be a High Elf, Khajiit, anything. They're all just going to have different attribute values based on their racial passives. So as playing as a Nord, you're going to have higher resistance values to where you don't have to use the Lady Munda Stone when you want to play a tank. You can use your own resistance values to play a tank more effectively. You can use the Lady Munda Stone to boost your resistances. It's up to you. Then moving on to crafting, alchemy, medicinal use, when using a potion, resulting effects last 30% longer. That's really important. And then provisioning, gourmet, and connoisseur. Now, these are for food. These allow the duration to be 20 minutes longer. I use a lot of food no matter what I'm doing in the game. Whether I'm playing solo overland, or I'm doing delves, or I'm doing public dungeons, I'm doing dolmens, I'm fighting a dragon, I'm doing abyssal geysers. I'm always using food. Potions, on the other hand, I only use in dungeons and trials. The reason why these things are super expensive to, to buy from other people and they're really kind of expensive to craft sometimes. Some food can be really hard, expensive to craft. This is why I stick to certain foods like Dubious Cameron Throne, Witch Mother's Brew, and um, Tristat food. They're pretty cheap on the market to buy and then potions are really expensive. So I save potions, like the, the more expensive potions like the Power Pots and stuff, for when I'm playing in a dungeon or trial setting. All right, moving on to the skills we have on our bar. Starting with the first bar, we do have Blood Craze. This does damage up front, damage over time, and over 10 seconds. And then on top of that, you heal every two seconds uh, for the duration. So every time that you tick damage, every two seconds, you're going to heal yourself too. So it's kind of a nice, like, oh crap, save me thing. The next one we have is called Rapid Strikes. Now, Rapid Strikes does X amount of damage up front, and each hit it does, um, because it does hit rapid attacks, each hit it does increases the damage by 3%, and then the final hit deals 300% more damage. So this thing does a lot of damage, and it is our primary spammable. Next ability we have is called Lightning Flood. Now you can use Liquid Lightning or Lightning Flood, your choice. Both do the same amount of damage. They both work kind of the same. I think one has a longer time limit, I'm not sure and then is a little cheaper. And this one, both of them are synergies that you can that your allies can activate for to make it do a conduit synergy dealing X amount of shock damage to enemies around them. Next ability we have on our bar is an, an execute and this thing you call down a lightning strike from the sky that deals X amount of damage 
If the enemy falls below 20% health within 4 seconds of being struck, an explosion deals X amount of shock damage to them and X amount of shock damage to nearby enemies. So this is a really good way to AoE your enemies down while executing one. So next we have Inner Light. Now this gives you increased max magic by 5% and increased spell critical by 2191. This is basically 10% spell crit. Now the 5% isn't just 5% because of the Mages Guild skill line. There is a passive in here that you can learn called Magicka Controller and increase your max Magicka and Magic Recovery by 2% for each piece of Mages or for each Mages Guild ability slotted. We get 2% increase in recovery and increase into our max stats. So we actually get 7% spell uh, max magicka here moving on we do have flawless dawnbreaker here we don't really use this that often um and we mainly use this in group trash fights it does x amount of damage up front x amount of damage over six seconds and then while slotted your weapon damage is increased by five percent moving on to the back bar <clears throat> first ability is venom arrow i really like venom arrow a lot of people complain to me a lot that i'm not using poison injection poison injection is really good if you're playing for a primary damage maximization. I don't play that way. I play to help my group in any way can, I can, and this can help my group. It does X amount of damage up front, X amount of damage over time. It does the same amount of damage actually as Poison Injection. The difference is the, five, the, the final benefit on Poison Injection increases your damage to enemies below 50% health by 200%. This one, if an enemy hit is casting an ability, they are interrupted, set off balance, and stunned for three seconds. That's why I like this. It really works as a good group support kind of ability. Next ability we have is Endless Hail. This one launches a multitude of arrows in the sky that rain down, dealing X amount of physical damage to enemies in the target area every 0.5 seconds for 10 seconds. Then we have Power Surge. Power Surge is really cool because Invoke Meridia's name to gain major brutality and major sorcery, increasing your weapon damage and spell damage by 20% for 33 seconds. While active, dealing a critical strike heals you for X amount of health. Th this effect can occur once every second. As long as you have this active, you're gonna be healing. And it's just gonna keep you alive. Next ability we have is Hurricane. Now you can go with Lightning Form or Hurricane, your choice with this because you can use either one. I like Hurricane because it does X amount of physical damage every second for 15 seconds, and the wind grows in size, increasing the damage by up to 150% damage and up to nine meters in size. That's why I like using this. While you're in this form, you gain major resolve and major ward and minor expedition, increasing your physical, spell, and movement speed. So your physical and spell resistance by 5,280 and your movement speed by 10%. Next, we have Inner Light again. This is to keep that Max Magicka higher and also to reduce our spell costs by an extra 2%. Remember, we have 4% spell cost reduction because we have this slot. Next up, we do use the Greater Storm Atronach. This one, you summon a Storm Atronach from the sky. It lands, it deals X amount of shock damage and stuns enemies for 3 seconds. The Atronach zaps the closest enemy, dealing X amount of shock damage every second for its duration of 28 seconds. And then it also applies, the, the Atronach can be, activate charged lightning synergy, granting the ally and the Atronach major berserk, increasing their damage done by 25% for 8 seconds. It's a very powerful synergy. And that is the skills that I use for when I'm playing damage dealer. Now. We're going to take a look at this CP, and then I'm going to show you some parsing. So, on to the CP. We have 56 in Ironclad, reducing your damage taken from direct damage attacks by 20%. We do have 20 in a medium armor focus. This increases spell or physical resistance by 1900 while wearing five or more pieces of medium armor. Now, remember how I told you guys that for every 660, you get a, a percentage of mitigation. You get 1% of mitigation. So when you have three of these, you get three, uh, or that's three, three points right there with the one piece of heavy armor. So we get three points of mitigation versus putting into here and taking this up to 81 to get three points or four points. 
when we could just do this and get three points. See, this is why I do this. Because this is this damage comes off up front. Then it takes the damage reduction into consideration. So you have to wear, wear five pieces of medium armor to get this resistance value. We are wear, do have spell shield, um, 18 points, which increases spell resistance by 1729. Remember, we get the heavy armor and the light armor benefit from it. So putting more points in here gives us that greater resistance value. And you don't need to put as many points in here. So, And you still get the three. Moving on over here, we have 31 into thick skin. This reduces your damage taken from damage over time effects by 13%. We have 43 into hardy, reducing your damage taken from physical poison disease damage by 10%. 43 into elemental defender, reducing your damage taken from flame frost shock and magic damage by 10%. And then moving on over here, we have 40 into bastion. This increases the effectiveness of your damage shields by 16%. We have 19 into Quick Recovery, increasing your healing received by 5%. And this 5% applies when you're tanking, healing, or just being a damage dealer. So this is really nice. The shield is there primarily, this is primarily there for when you want to tank, or you want to play solo, or you want to be a healer and you want to offer some group support. You can use this for that purpose. Now moving on. We have 40 into Warlord. This reduces Break Free by 16%. We have 16 in the Sprinter, reducing Sprint cost by 10%. 16 in the Bashing Focus, reducing Bash cost by 10%. And then moving on over here, we have 43 in the Moon Calf, increasing Stam Recovery by 10%. Now, I'm just showing you an, another th way you can do this. So, this allows you the 10% Stam Recovery. 43 in the Arcanius allows you a Magic Recovery by 10%. And then 43 in the Tenacity increases your Magic and Stamina return of your fully charged heavy attacks by 10%. Now, if you wanted to, you could take out of here and put 75 into this and the one point out of healthy because we had an extra point left over and you could put 40 into tumbling. This will increase your dodge roll cost. Um, we have 28 there now for by 12%, but with 40 in here, it gives you 16. And then we have 40 in the Shadow Orb, reducing your block cost by 16%. Remember, everything here is to play so you can play your character how you want in any role, in any situation. Now, moving on, we have 43 into Bless. This increases healing done by 10%. 23 into Elfborn. This increases critical damage and critical healing with magic abilities by 10%. 43 into Elemental Expert. This increases Flame, Frost, Shock, and Magic damage by 10%. If you didn't know, Sorks get an increase of 5% Shock damage. So we actually have 15% on Shock damage. Moving on, 35 in the physical weapon expert, since that's the primary weapons we use, um, we're going to take advantage of that. And this allows you to do increased damage in your light and heavy attacks with all stamina based weapons. That's uh, two handed, one handed sword and shield, dual wield bow, and werewolf form by 20%. And then we have 40 in the master at arms. This increases damage done with direct damage attacks by 16%. And then moving on over here, we have 43 into Mighty. This increases physical poison disease damage by 10%. 23 into Precise Strikes, increasing critical damage and critical healing of stamina abilities by 10%. And then 20 into Thaumaturge, increasing your damage done with damage over time effects by 9%. All right, now that you guys have seen the CP, gear, traits, enchants, all that stuff, and how the character's set up, I'm going to show you some parsing. So this character um, does a decent amount of damage when it parses. It's not insane because we aren't using Trap Beast. If I had Trap Beast on here, I can actually pull more DPS with this character. But I'm not using Trap Beast because I don't want to sacrifice my ability to stay alive and heal. So I'm going to go ahead and use my potion and, and begin my parse. And I screwed up already. Okay, 18k. I can usually pull about t between 18 and 25k on that guy, depending on how I have my character set up. If I'm using Trap Beast instead of the Power Surge, I can actually get up to a l about 25k. Now, we're going to go over here and we're going to parse on the big one. Now, the big one over here, this is made for gr organized group play. This is if you're playing in a trial and you pretty much have one of every class in your group. 
and you have all the buffs, the debuffs, and everything that you can apply to an enemy and to your group. All right, so let's go ahead and buff up again. We're going to use Hurricane, Crit Surge, and we are going to use Synergies this time. Hurricane, thank you. But as you can see, I can get about thirty-two thousand uh, DPS with this uh, when I'm when I'm pulling really good, just as it is. Now, if I have Trap Beast on here, I can pull almost forty k with this thing. It's pretty ridiculous. But that is the Blade Singer in action there. Now we're gonna go ahead and change a few things so we can play this more solo friendly. And the only thing I need to do to make it solo friendly is just do this. Um, because this thing's pretty powerful as is. Now, I can use Bone Shield, or I can use my own class ability um, from Daedric Summoning. I can use Empower Ward. This will increase my, my, me, my shield, or give me a damage shield that's capped at 50% or 40% of my max health. It also grants me and my allies minor intellect, increasing our mag recovery by 10% for 10 seconds. I can use this. Um, so we'll go ahead and use this instead of Bone Shield. We're going to go ahead and teleport to my favorite testing dungeon right now, which is Depths of Malatar. And this is the latest dungeon added with the Wrathstone DLC. So it's one of two dungeons, and it's one of the more difficult ones. And people have asked me, why not Frost? Why don't you test in Frostfold? Frostfold requires two or more people to face the final boss, or the first boss. So I don't do that one. That's why I test in here. Because that first boss encounter can can really mess you up if you if you're not on the ball. People can solo it, but it's really hard. All right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go in here, and I do want to show you guys this real quick. So this is the parse we just did on the big dummy, and as you can see, we had 4760 weapon damage with a 64% crit, 60% uh, critical damage. Our damage isn't super high. If we were using Trap Beast, we'd have a 70% critical damage. And if we were a, a Khajiit, we'd actually get 80% with Trap Beast. Now, moving on over here, you can see we go to 3510 spell damage. We also get an extra 400 added to all shock damage. So we actually break almost 4k spell damage. With a 47.9% spell critical. Now, on the first dummy, um, where we got the 18k... As you can see, we get 3k spell damage, almost 3.4k um, spell damage with shock. And then over here, we actually get 4k physical damage. So it's kind of a mixing. We do have a 58% weapon critical. And this is when we're fighting the, the smaller gun. So your choice you have there for the kind of damage you want to do. Now I'm going to go in here. I'm just going to solo this up to the boss. Now I can I can promise you I can solo the boss. I can solo this whole dungeon with this character the way they are. Uh, it's not difficult. Oh, I missed him before he got a chance to hit him with that. I did that wrong. Oh well. Oh, 
Then it's time for you to die. And yes, if you guys didn't know, I I think I just killed him with with the um, reposit from blocking. So, where are you hiding, ugly? I know you're in here. I can smell your breath. It's not pleasant. Nobody likes you. made it okay so I screwed up there I was gonna wait until the last second and get out of the poison stuff so I could do as much damage as possible but I made a mistake my bad it happens so but yeah I can solo this this is a, it's a it's kind of a cakewalk for me because I've done it so many times but this character is a lot of fun and I really hope you guys like the idea behind it and the concept and everything like that if you guys do you guys know what's coming next if you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. If you guys want to see more videos by me, you can subscribe. Other than that, I want to thank you all for watching. Until next time, have a wonderful day, and this guy might see you in game. Bye.